So often you and I have this internal narrative about what was going to happen when we share the gospel with someone. Now, I've been yelled at when I've told people I'm a follower of Jesus or a pastor. I've been yelled at right away. That's happened. But I can't let that stop me from sharing it with the next person. Could it be that at times in our own lives we feel excluded because we're not grasping onto the fact that we're united together in Christ. My identity is that I'm a baptized man. I'm a son of God. I'm I'm in Jesus Christ. We're continuing the series, Message on the Move. We're looking at how the gospel message, the good news of Jesus, spreads right after Jesus ascends to heaven. Jesus died. He rose again. He ascended to heaven. And then he tells the apostles to wait until the Holy Spirit comes. And when the Holy Spirit comes, that message is going to move. It's going to move from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the very ends of the earth. And today we get just a little picture of that phrase, the ends of the earth, because we're going to be looking at uh, the message, the gospel message on the fringe from Acts 8, 26 through 40. Now, last week, Dr. Greg Perry did a great job of basically giving you the whole book of Acts, but not only that, almost the whole Bible, as he preached from Acts 11 in the church on Antioch, really helpful. The week before that, we looked at Acts chapter 8, uh, before verse 26, and we looked at how Philip the evangelist went to Samaria and literally led hundreds of people to Christ and then interacted with this character named Simon the Magician. Today at the center of our story, Philip is still at the center of our story, but he's somewhere else meeting someone else. He's on the fringes again of where the gospel has yet gone, and he's meeting someone who's from outside the fringe, someone who is excluded, someone who's an outsider, an Ethiopian eunuch. So let me pray for us, and then we'll read Acts verse 26 through 40. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you came from heaven to the fringe here on earth. You you came from outside, you came to be outside your comfort zone to die for us, to bring your kingdom into this world. And we pray, Lord, that you might open up this story, that we might be changed. We need your Holy Spirit right now. I need your Holy Spirit. We pray that we our hearts would be open and that we would be transformed by your word. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Acts 8, verse 26 says, An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, Get up and go south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is the desert road. So he, Philip, got up and went, and there was an Ethiopian man, a eunuch, and high official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of her her entire treasury. He had come to worship in Jerusalem and was sitting in his chariot on his way home, reading the prophet Isaiah aloud. The spirit told Philip, go and join that chariot. When Philip ran up to it, he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? How can I, he said, unless someone guides me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the scripture passage he was reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. As a lamb is silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who will describe his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. The eunuch said to Philip, I ask you, who is the prophet saying this about, himself or someone else? Philip proceeded to tell him the good news about Jesus, beginning with that scripture. As they were traveling down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, there's water. What would keep me from being baptized? So he ordered the chariot to stop, and Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him any longer, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip appeared in an Azotus, and he was traveling and preaching the gospel in all the towns until he came to Caesarea. 
the word of the Lord. I don't know if you've ever been to a party, a children's party, a children's party when there, where there's been a piñata, but it gets crazy. It gets really crazy. Uh, y- you know that there's all this expectation as this piñata, this poor paper mache donkey is getting whacked on by these children. And the expectation builds as uh, part of the paper mache begins to fall off and everyone knows what's happening. And you see the children start to grit their teeth and kind of get like this and start, you know, blocking other people out so that they can get to the piñata first. And then once that thing breaks, it is total mayhem. Kids are in there, you know, they're pulling on candy, there's elbows flying, all the moms are like, make sure, make sure that everyone gets candy, and the dads say that, but privately the dads like, get some good candy, even if you have to push a kid over, get that Snickers bar for me. But, you you know, at those piñatas, I've noticed there's always something that happens, There's kids who sort of get what's happened and what's going on and are there. They're on the inside. They're ready. They get all the good candy. But then there's always some children on the outside who aren't quite sure, how does this work? Where do I go? They're kind of on the outskirts. They're kind of on the fringe. And they tend to not get the good candy because they're not the first ones in. Now, some of you might have grown up and be like, that was me. I I was on the fringe when it came to the piñata. And others of you were like, no, it was cutthroat, man. I was not waiting around for those Tootsie Rolls to be the only thing left. I was going for the Snickers and the Twix. But even as those certain children can sometimes be on the fringe, I think in all of our lives, there's places where you and I feel like we're on the fringe, We feel like we're on the outside looking in. We we feel like we just can't keep up in order to to fully participate. We feel like things are happening and and for whatever reason, we're we're kind of excluded. We're trying to figure out how to get in there and participate with what's going on, but we often end up on the fringe. And, And I think everyone experiences that on some level in some area of their life. Every one of us has some sort of felt experience where we go somewhere or we're part of something and we just feel like, ah, this isn't really for me. This is for someone else. I'm kind of on the outside of this looking in. We all have that experience somewhere. But I think at times in church, we can experience that as well. We come to church and we can kind of go, you know what? This is really for other people. Like, I'm, I'm an outsider they're the insiders. I'm just sort of looking in. But we've had that experience, right? Not only that, but I think sometimes people believe that Christianity is like that. Christianity is like that piñata event that actually leaves people out. Like the whole Christian faith is about excluding people. I've had people say that to me before when I've told them that I'm a pastor, I'm a follower of Jesus. They've literally come right back and said, well, you know, religion excludes people. So I think not only have we had that in our personal lives, and sometimes we've experienced that at church, but sometimes people believe that Christianity is about leaving people out. But today we see that the gospel message moves to the fringes. The gospel message is for the insider, but it's also for the outsider. It's for the excluded. And in our passage today, we see two things. One is that the message includes people from the fringe. But then secondly, the the message exudes to the fringes. That word exude means it kind of seeps out. And, And as the gospel message calls us out of the fringes to be included, it also sends us back to the fringes with this very same message. In our passage today, we're introduced to a man who's on the fringe. Verse 27, we learn that this man is an Ethiopian eunuch who has come to Jerusalem to worship. Now, as an Ethiopian, this is the ancient kingdom of Ethiopia, probably uh, also known as Nubia, and what would be modern-day Sudan. So not necessarily modern-day Ethiopia. He's probably from the area of Sudan. 
and he has traveled over a thousand miles by chariot, approximately five miles per hour, to come from ancient Ethiopia to Jerusalem to worship. Now, as an Ethiopian, he is a Gentile, meaning he is not a Jew. So this is not his homeland. This is not his home God. Somehow he has heard about the God of Israel while living in ancient Ethiopia and has become a fearer of God, meaning he's following God and has made this trek all the way to Jerusalem so that he can go to the temple and worship at ground zero of where God lives. But the text... Luke, in the text, wants us to see something even more than just being an Ethiopian. Five times, Luke lets us know that this man is not just an Ethiopian, he's a eunuch, meaning that he is a male who has been sterilized or even castrated. And the reason that he's been sterilized is because he was in charge of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, he was in charge of her treasury. Now, Candace was a proper title for the queen, much like Pharaoh was a title for Ramsey. Candace was a title for whatever queen this was, possibly even the queen's mother at the time. And a eunuch was someone who had been sterilized so that there wouldn't be any issue with him working closely with royal women. Okay? So here we have This man who's an Ethiopian and he's a eunuch, but he has an incredible amount of power in Ethiopia. He is the queen's money man. He's her CFO. But his appearance, by his appearance, you could probably tell that he was a eunuch. Because oftentimes when someone was made a eunuch, it was before they hit puberty. And so the normal process that our bodies would go through during puberty he would not have gone through that process. So he was older but didn't look old. He might not have had any facial hair. And by looking at him, you probably would have been able to tell that he was a eunuch. Well, here he has traveled 1,000 miles to the temple, a Gentile from Ethiopia, and he comes to the temple, the temple of Yahweh, the temple of the God of Israel who has saved his people out of Egypt, who has given them their law, his law. And he comes to the temple to find out that he's excluded. Well, he's actually doubly excluded. As a Gentile, he would only have been allowed in the court of the Gentiles. He would not have been allowed to go in where the people of Israel were. The temple was this beautiful structure, and everything was symmetrical and it was majestic, and it was meant to give you a sense of God's presence because that's where God lived. God lived in the inner sanctuary, the Holy of Holies, and only one priest could go in one time a year into the Holy of Holies. And the whole temple structure was meant to give you this sense that God is holy and God is complete, and he's not like us. And so Gentiles, those who were not part of the ethnic people of God, were allowed to get close but not too close because they were different than the Israelites. And so here's this Ethiopian man who gets to the temple to worship, and he may have found out, I can't get too close because of who I am and where I'm from. But not only that, as a eunuch, he would have also been doubly excluded The temple was meant to represent God in his perfection, in his completeness, that everything worked the way it was supposed to, that God was holy and righteous and complete. And there was a law that said since eunuchs aren't complete, they cannot go in deep into the temple. They are excluded. Now, that might have been because often people were sterilized in pagan worship, and God said, listen, this is for worship of me, the one true God, and so we don't want to invite pagan rituals into the temple. But for whatever reason, here we have a man who fears God and wants to follow him, and he's only permitted in the court of the Gentiles. And so he probably felt some kind of way on his way home. That thousand-mile journey, he's about to head home. I can imagine he might have been a little disappointed on some level, felt a little excluded, felt like an outsider, felt like someone on the fringe. 
And so as he's going home in this royal chariot, starting this thousand-mile journey, he opens his Bible, his Old Testament scripture, and he begins to read. And as he reads, he reads about someone who he doesn't know, but sees that this same person was also someone on the fringe, was also someone who appeared to be some sort of outsider who seems to be excluded. He, he opens up his Old Testament to Isaiah 53, and now the scripture passage he was reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and a lamb, and as a lamb is silent before its shearers, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him, for who will describe his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And as he begins to read this, you, you wonder what he saw and what he felt. Here, here's someone who's been excluded, and I've been excluded. Here's someone who was pushed to the outside. I've been pushed to the outside. Here's someone whose life was cut off. I've been cut off. So as he reads, he goes, who, who is this? And just at that moment, another man approaches his chariot. We know it's Philip, but the Ethiopian eunuch did not know who it was. It says that Philip ran up to the chariot, verse 30, and he heard this Ethiopian eunuch reading the prophet Isaiah and said, hey, do you understand what you're reading? And the eunuch said, how can I? Unless someone guides me. So the eunuch invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And the eunuch goes, who is this? Who is this I'm reading about? Is it the prophet or is he talking about someone else? Is it Isaiah? Who, who is it? And it says in verse 35 that Philip told him who it was. It was Jesus. Jesus, the one whose life was cut off unjustly. Jesus, the one who went to the outside of the camp. Jesus, the one who was cursed for our sins. Jesus, the one who was denied justice and excluded because he took the weight of God's wrath on himself for us. In verse 35, it says, Philip proceeded to tell him the good news about Jesus, beginning with that scripture. That the reason that this man underwent such suffering and becoming an outsider and was excluded was for him. He had gone to the cross for his sin. And you kind of wonder, it says beginning with that scripture. He almost makes it sound like Philip kept turning, right? Isaiah 53. You kind of wonder if from there he went to Isaiah 55 and it says, Come everyone who is thirsty, come to the water and, and you without silver, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without silver and without cost. And you wonder if Philip kept reading and the Ethiopian unit said, I want that. But then you have to wonder, did he flip just three chapters over? Because in Isaiah 56, it talks about this time when the foreigner would no longer be excluded and when the eunuch would no longer be cut off from the people of God. It says, no foreigner has joined himself to the, who has joined himself to the Lord should say, the Lord will exclude me from his people. And the eunuch should not say, look, I am a dried up tree. For the Lord says this, the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath and choose what pleases me and hold firmly to my covenant, I will give them in my house, in my temple, in my presence. I will give them in my house and within my walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give each of them an everlasting name that will never be cut off. As for the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister him, to love the name of the Lord and to become his servants, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and who hold firmly to my covenant, I will bring them to my holy mountain. I will bring them into my presence and let them rejoice in my house of prayer. You have to wonder if Philip turn just three chapters over because a text like that would have hit home about what Jesus does for someone like the Ethiopian eunuch, someone who's doubly excluded from the presence of God, someone who's doubly excluded from fully participating with the people of God, but not 
when you believe in Jesus. The eunuch who's cut off is included. The foreigner who's an outsider becomes an insider. And as the Ethiopian eunuch is hearing about the good news of Jesus, that the identity marker that he needs is Jesus Christ to be fully included in the people of God and be welcomed in the presence of God, he begins to understand that it's by repentance and faith that he's included and that a mark on his body can't exclude him. It's by being born again that he's included in the family of God. It's not by being a foreigner that he's separated from the people of God. And you can almost feel his heart starting to pound as he begins to understand what the good news of Jesus can actually do for him. And in verse 38 and 39, he orders the chariot to stop. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. Baptism, the mark of inclusion. Do you know, do you know that's what baptism really is? Like the mark of baptism is a mark that you have been fully accepted into the people of God. When, when we say in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, that's not just some ritual. Jesus commanded that because you, his name, the name of our Trinitarian God, is now marking you as your primary identity for eternity. If you were separated, you're now joined. If you were excluded, you're now fully included. If you were on the fringe, you're right now in the very presence of God because the Holy Spirit of God comes to live in you permanently. Through Jesus Christ. But we understand his excitement. What's to keep me from being baptized here in this desert? I mean, who knows where this water came from in the middle of a desert road, but I want to be baptized now. In the very next verse, we find out they came up, when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him any longer, but went on his way. What? Rejoicing, rejoicing because he's now part of the movement of God. The, the first thing we can learn from this passage is that the message of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, includes people from the fringe. It includes people from the fringe. And what that means is you're included from the fringe. If you've repented and believed and you trust in Jesus Christ, as your Savior, for the forgiveness of all your sins, you have been included from the fringe. Your sin has pushed you to the outskirts. You, you, you sit under the wrath of God in your sin until Jesus goes to the outskirts for you, who's crucified outside of Jerusalem on Golgotha. He's put up on the cross as a criminal so that you and he could trade places. The message includes people from the fringe. That means that you're included from the fringe. And your first and primary identity before God is that you're in Christ. That you're united to Jesus Christ. Doesn't matter if you feel united. Doesn't matter if you feel like I'm having a great day or a bad day. The truest reality about you if you're a Christian is that when God looks at you, he sees his son in you. You are a child of God. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. And the primary marker to remind you of that is your baptism. If your identity is in Christ, your baptism is like your, ident your ID. It's like your passport. It's like your passport. And sometimes I find that we can make secondary identities into our primary identities. Here we have an Ethiopian and a eunuch who probably was pushed to the side at the temple. Um, and sometimes I believe that as Christians, we can look and see things about other Christians that are different from us. And rather than accepting them because they're in Christ and they're baptized, we can treat them differently because of something else. Personality differences, ethnic differences, cultural backgrounds, things like that. And what we're reminded here 
today is just as the eunuch is fully accepted before God, we should fully accept each other in Jesus Christ. But I think we need to reverse that too and, and just ask the question, are we holding on to a secondary identity and making it a primary identity and then in our heads, we're not wanting to be included because we have valued something about our identity besides being in Christ. In other words, if you feel like you're on the outside looking in, it's not that that's not real. Uh, but notice the Ethiopian eunuch, how much he has joy just over the fact that he's baptized into Christ. That becomes who he is. Could it be that at times in our own lives, we feel excluded because we're not grasping onto the fact that we're united together in Christ. My identity is that I'm a baptized man. I'm a son of God. I'm, I'm in Jesus Christ. Or, or could we exclude ourselves from each other, from fully participating, because we're holding on to something else? I know at times in the church, some people can go, I'll, I'll never be fully included because of my past. At the same time, some people go, you know what, I'll never be fully included because I don't really have a past. I've known Jesus since I was born, basically. You know, and we begin to start to treat each other differently based on things like that or based on different cultures. We have different cultures in this church, and we can, we can treat each other differently or think about ourselves differently or even creatives. I know that a lot of times in the church, creatives come in, artists come in, and they feel like they're a little bit excluded. But what does it mean to go, our primary identity is that we're in Christ together. That's where the relationship with each other starts. That's where we begin. And I would encourage you today to make that identity your own because the message includes us from the fringe. And our primary identity becomes who we are in Jesus Christ. And that means we are included. But then secondly, with that... Uh, Notice that Jesus is for all people on the fringe. Sometimes when we encounter people who are suffering or who have hard things in their life, we rightly try and alleviate the suffering. We rightly try and alleviate the injustice or what's made them a victim, but we forget to share Jesus with them. Now, I think a while ago it was the opposite. It was like, I'm going to share Jesus with you, and I'm not going to worry about your suffering. But I, I think right now, the, the temptation of the church could be to actually alleviate someone's suffering, to step into their challenges, but forget to share Jesus with them. Here we have a eunuch who, in one sense, has a lot of power. In another sense, he's oppressed, right? He's missing body parts, probably, just to put it bluntly. And he is forced into service. And then he comes to the temple, and he's excluded there. But notice what Philip does. Philip doesn't talk about his exclusion from the temple. Philip doesn't talk about how to navigate the royal court as a eunuch. He shares Jesus with him. And it's not that it's one or the other, but what we see here is that Philip doesn't just focus on the challenges in the eunuch's life. He talks to him about Christ because this man still needs Jesus. I mean, when we're in the midst of suffering, who can help us more than the one who suffered for us? If we're in the midst of oppression, who can help us more than the one who was oppressed on the cross for us? When we're on the fringes, we look to Jesus, our Savior, who was put on the fringes, who was cut off from life so that you and I could live. And the amazing thing about this Ethiopian eunuch was he, he doesn't go back to the temple and be like, I'm included in Jesus, forget y'all, I'm out of here. No, he goes back to ancient Ethiopia. He goes back to Nubia. And Arrhenius, a church father, has recorded that this Ethiopian eunuch brought the gospel to the ends of the earth. And ancient Ethiopia had many conversions because this man on the fringe went back to the fringe with the message. And there's, you know, it's kind of hard to tell exactly what happened, but there's accounts even that the queen became a Christian because this man went back 
with the message of Jesus. It, utter, it utterly changed him. Jesus is for our people on the fringe. And so he goes back to the fringe and leads all these people to Christ. The man who can't have any children now has hundreds, thousands of spiritual children. The one who was excluded is now included. Because the message includes us from the fringe, but it also exudes to the fringe. Now, I said exudes, meaning it kind of oozes towards the fringe. It oozes out. And, and here we see that the Ethiopian eunuch goes back to the fringe. As a man on the fringe, he goes back and shares the gospel in Nubia. And many people come to know Jesus. But we also really haven't looked at the story from Philip's perspective. Philip, who ran from Jerusalem and led people to Christ in Samaria is then told by an angel to go to the fringe. The angel tells him to go to Gaza. Gaza? There's nothing there. That's like a desert before you get into the desert. It would be like a place where you say, last stop before nowhere. And the angel tells Philip to go to Gaza, go to the fringe. What's there? Well, then he gets there, and in verse 29, the, the Holy Spirit tells Philip to go and join that chariot. Now, the Greek behind that is stronger than just go and join. It's, it's like, get up in there and bind yourself to that man and talk with him. So here, Philip's on the fringe, and then he goes and sees another guy on the fringe, and the Holy Spirit tells him, go sit in there. Go tell him about Jesus. And with great respect, Philip seizes the opportunity and goes. Philip runs up to the chariot and he hears that the eunuch is reading about the prophet Isaiah and says, do you understand what you're reading? I wonder if Philip knew the opportunity that he was about to have. I mean, if Philip hadn't gone to Gaza, if he hadn't gone to the fringe and talked to this guy in the fringe, ancient Ethiopia might not have been converted to Christ. But here he takes this opportunity an opportunity on the fringe. It makes me wonder about those places in our lives where we feel like we're on the fringe and we can't wait to get out. Could it be that God has us there? Could it be that God has us in those desert places to just look around and see who else is there and share the good news of Jesus with them? I heard a story about a pastor who went into a fast food restaurant, and while he was in the fast food restaurant, he got to the front of the line, and one of the brightest, smartest people in his congregation was behind the register. The guy behind the register was a member of the church and had actually got a master's degree from Harvard. Now, we've had a lot of people who have worked at fast food. It's a challenging job, and I know that behind that counter, it feels like you're on the fringe, right, as you watch other people come in. It's a challenging job, but the pastor asked this guy, wait, wait a minute, you just graduated with a master's from Harvard, why are you here? And he said, well, I, I tried to get a job, and I just couldn't get one, and so rather than just sitting at home, I decided to come and work at this fast food restaurant, and the pastor immediately said, I'm so sorry, but before he could get the word out sorry, the man behind the counter interrupted him and said, don't be sorry, God has me here. God has me here. I have met people from around the world behind this counter, and I'm getting to be a representative of Jesus to them here on the fringe. Uh, could God have you in a spot like that where you might be so ready to get out of it or so uh, challenged to go there and stay there, but could he have you there for an opportunity? When you say, I don't, I don't know how to take advantage of that opportunity. I don't know how to be somewhere that's uncomfortable around people that, that are outsiders or around people that are insiders when I feel like the outsider. But I love how simple Philip's strategy is here. He follows the leading of the Holy Spirit. He shares the scripture with him. And then he presents the good news of Jesus. Follows the Holy Spirit, shares scripture, and then gives him the good news of Jesus. Whether you're on the inside or the outside, whether you're separated or included, whether you're in the middle of things or on the fringe, the strategy is the same. And that's so important. And I love the fact that the Ethiopian eunuch has such 
a positive response. In verse 31, he says, how can I understand all this unless you tell me? So often, you and I have this internal narrative about what was going to happen when we share the gospel with someone. Now, I've been yelled at when I've told people I'm a follower of Jesus or a pastor. I've been yelled at right away. That's happened. But I can't let that stop me from sharing it with the next person. I can't let that stop me from sharing the best news because I don't know what their response is going to be. Just like this eunuch's response is positive, you never know if someone's going to have a positive response. I mean, what happens if you share the gospel after 10 years of friendship and your friend says to you, this is the best thing I've ever heard. Why didn't you tell me this 10 years ago? That actually happens because this is good news. Fifteen years ago, when I was doing ministry in London, we would put uh, pamphlets on a table out in the middle of the street, or actually on the side of the street, and we were in a part of the city that was on the outskirts. It was on the fringe, and most of the people there were from South Asia. They were, they were from Pakistan and, and uh, Western India and Sri Lanka, and so we would get in conversations with people just based on their religion and what we believed about Jesus. And I really enjoyed talking with a lot of people. But I remember one particular conversation where this young man kind of wandered up to me. And he introduced him and he said his name was Sanjay. And very early in the conversation, someone else walked by this man as we were talking and said, hey, talking to me, you don't really want to talk to that guy. And as I began to talk to Sanjay, I realized that he was addicted and in the middle of addiction to drugs. And we just began talking. And he just said, you know, my life's not going anywhere. I can't quit. No one likes me. My family doesn't trust me. What is this that you have here? Like, what is this about? And I began to just simply tell him about Jesus. That Jesus died. And if he repented and believed, Jesus would forgive him and accept him and unite himself to him and walk with him forever. And I remember Sanjay was like, can you say that one more time? You're saying that if I believe in Jesus, he will accept me? And I said, that's it, buddy. It's that simple. And I could see like, you know, for Sanjay, who was excluded from his society, excluded from his family, excluded because of his addiction, he could not believe that Jesus would accept him. But I said with confidence, man, he'll accept you because he's accepted me. He's accepted me. I'm no different than you. Because of my own sin and failure, I'm on the fringe without Jesus. But because of Jesus, I've been brought to the very center. The Spirit of God now lives in me, and he'll live in you too, Sanjay. Sanjay went away with a different view of what it meant to follow Jesus. And you can too today. I know many of you might feel like in your lives, I'm on the fringe for whatever reason. And that's all real. There's things in our past. There's things in our present. There's ways that we're different. There's ways that we feel on the outside. And all that's real. But what's more real is what Jesus has done for you. Your sins can be forgiven be accepted, you can be part of this family. God gives you your baptism as a way to remind you that it's true. He is so faithful to us and he sends us back out to the fringes to share that same good news that brought us in from the fringes.